Uh, and so we um, hope that hopefully that you have gained something from these Bible classes. I know that um, a lot of people have been viewing them online. Uh, we have some 360 plus thousand views on our um, YouTube um, page. And uh, of course, that might seem to be a lot, but when you look at the heathens, theirs is in the millions. So uh, if my mind's get into the millions, then I'll get excited. But we thank the Lord for, for those that have been watching and tuning us in on a regular basis and calling in questions and emailing us and what have you. Uh, we thank God um, for you. It just goes to show that there's a lot of people out there that want the word. A lot of people out there that want the truth. And of course, um, we do have the truth, which is the apostolic doctrine. Praise the Lord. And we thank God because without the truth, we cannot be saved. And there's only one truth. Is that right? Only one truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So tonight we're going to look at Judas, who is the sixth one to uh, apostatize from God. He was one of the apostles. He was a bishop among the apostles and was with Jesus for three and a half years through his ministry. But he fell and uh, into sin and committed suicide and was lost. Now, of course, he was not uh, predestinated to be lost because predestination does not work like that in the Bible. He had a free choice, just like anybody else. And of course, we all have free choice. Even the angels have free choice. Um, God does not want any robots. Um, so, but he decided to go the way that he went. God didn't make him do it. It was his choice. And so um, as we look at his life, and the word named Judas means false one, uh, he definitely uh, fulfilled that role because he was not genuine in the sight of God. Now you think about it, that if a man can fall in, while being personally taught by Jesus, then you know anybody can fall today. And of course, that does away with the doctrine of unconditional eternal security, uh, which teaches that once saved is always saved uh, because Judas failed. Now, there are some scriptures in the Old Testament in referring to Judas, and uh, we're going to look at uh, probably one of those. There, there are many, but we're just going to look at one of them because we're not going to spend a lot of time on Judas. We want to get to the church age because that's more important. But I want you to realize that um, there were prophecies that had to be fulfilled when it came to Jesus. His betrayal was prophesied, so it had to happen. His uh, being sold for 30 pieces of silver had to happen because God saw it happen. God does everything based on his foreknowledge. And so let's look at one of the scriptures in Zechariah chapter number 11 and verse 12 to 13. Now this is very important uh, and very pivotal to us uh, because of this fact. The scriptures have got to be fulfilled. And there are good scriptures that are to be fulfilled and there are bad scriptures that are to be fulfilled. And we have to determine which portion of scripture that we're going to fulfill. Are we going to fulfill the bad part or are we going to fulfill the good part? And we will uh, enlarge upon that as we go along. So Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 through 13. Zechariah chapter 11, uh, verse 12 and 13. And we're going to ask if everyone will read together in unison as we um, go through scriptures. We hope you brought your Bibles. Praise the Lord. Amen. I know that we have Bibles on our phone, but there's nothing like uh, having it in your hand and being able to mark some things. Uh, in your Bible. Can we say amen? Praise the Lord. So, uh, Zechariah chapter 11 and verse number 12. Let's read. And I said unto them, if ye think good, 
Give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, this prophecy was given uh, more than 400 years, probably better than 500 years before it was actually fulfilled. Now, for every prophecy of scripture, every prophecy must be fulfilled. And then of course, there's one uh, prophecy concerning Judas, uh, talks about um, he's lifted up his heel against me. My own familiar friend hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, God did not make Judas betray Christ. He just knew that he would do it. And God, because he knows everything that's gonna happen before it happens, he chooses people based upon what he knows they're going to do. And so let's look at one scripture to support that. Well, let's go to Psalms 41 and 9, first of all, uh, and read that scripture that we just quoted to you. Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 41 and 9. And then we will go to um, the gospel according to St. John. Psalms 41 and verse number 9. All right. Very familiar passage of scripture. Those of us that are uh, read our Bibles and are Bible students, can we say amen? All right. And um, if we have it, let's read. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. And of course, uh, we know that uh, at this time, this is more than a thousand years before Judas came on the scene, David prophesied as the Spirit of Christ was upon him uh, that it was going to happen. Now, the Bible makes prophetic statements. All of us are going to fulfill some part of the scripture. It is impossible for it not to happen because the scriptures were written based upon the fore knowledge of God. That simply means that the scriptures and prophecy were written beforehand based upon what God has already seen happen. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah 46 and 10 that he declares the end from what? The beginning. God knows everything that's going to happen. But we decide what scripture we're going to fulfill. Now, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That scripture is going to be fulfilled. But the question is, who are the individuals that will rise from being dead in Christ who are the individuals that will be alive and remain when he comes? Who are the individuals that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air? We determine whether or not we fulfill that scripture by what we do right now. Then there's another scripture uh, that says this, that um, and they were cast into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Somebody's got to fulfill that scripture. Why is that? Because God seen it. Now we decide whether what scripture we're gonna fulfill. And you see, we don't normally think about that like that because generally, uh, most of the time we're in our flesh and we do what we feel that we want to do. That's why it's good not to get in your feelings. Can we say amen? You don't walk with God based on your feelings. You walk with God based on faith. And so somebody or all of us, should we say, is going to fulfill some part of the word of God. But, it, it, but you have to make that decision. You decide what scriptures you're going to fulfill by how you live, by how obedient. Now we're living in a day of disobedience and when we get into 
the church age. We're going to cover some very shocking things. So I don't want to spend a lot of time with Judas here uh, because we know about his story. Uh, but he was chosen. He was chosen. And he was chosen to do a job that was a bad job to do. God didn't make him do it, but he chose him based upon what he knew he would do. And he used him in his plan. Let's go to um, St. John chapter 6 and verse 67 through 71. St. John chapter 6. The scriptures are being fulfilled right now. What God has said will happen is happening right now. St. John chapter 6. Verse 67 through 71, and of course, um, um, we are breaking in the middle of a situation here where um, Jesus chose 72 disciples, 60 of them walked away uh, after he uh, told them what it would cost them to walk with him, 60 of them walked away, and it only leaves the 12. And so this is what we find him making the statement in verse 67. Let's read. Then said Jesus, unto the 12, will ye also what? Go away. Are you going to leave just like the rest of them? The rest of them left because the price was too high for them to pay. So is the price too high for you to pay to be saved? Are you going to walk away too? Will you also go away? Verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Now they knew that their Christ would be their God. And so he is saying, we believe that you are God in the office of the sonship, or you are the Messiah, or you are the anointed one, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. All right, verse 70, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil, verse 71. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So he chose Judas, did he? Now he chose Judas in the sense that he knew what he would do. And so he handpicked him, not that he made him do it, but he knew his man. And this is where Bible scholars get confused when they think that God has chosen some people to be saved and chosen some people to be lost and it has, they, there's nothing they can do about it. They're just going to be lost no matter what they do. They're just going to be saved no matter what they do. That's not how predestination works. Um, it is his foreknowledge. And because God knew his man, he can use him in the role to bring to pass what he had determined by the mouth of the prophets that would happen. Now, somebody says that there was nothing about Abraham, that God just chose Abraham randomly. That's not true at all, because if you read the 18th chapter of Genesis, the Bible lets you know why God chose Abraham. He chose Abraham, he said, because I know him, that he will command his children, and they will walk with me. So God needed somebody to fill, to fill that role, and so he chose Abraham because he knew what Abraham would do. Now, the Bible says that ye are a chosen what? Generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who, should call you, who has called you out of darkness into what? Now, we've been chosen, is that right? Chosen for what? Chosen to make the rapture or chosen to be lost? Well, only God knows. Can we say amen? He's not going to make us be lost, but all of us are chosen. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, you're chosen. But what portion of the scripture are we going to fulfill? The good or the bad? Only you, only I can determine that. And it will be determined because the scriptures are based upon what God has seen in his foreknowledge as to what everybody would do 
with in any given situation. Now, we are to believe that we're going to make it. Can we say amen? <laughs> we ought to believe that we're going to be saved. Because we are saved to be saved. We have been saved by the new birth. We are being saved as we walk with God and lay aside every weight and the sin that do so easily beset us. And we shall be saved when the rapture takes place. But none of us have made it yet. Can we say amen? Even Paul, at the time he was alive, he says, not as though as I have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things that are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the what? High calling of God. And that high calling of God is holiness. I'm pressing to be holy. Not pressing for praise, but pressing to what? To be holy. Holiness comes first, then the praise comes. Can we say amen? <laughs> all right. So keep that in mind then. Uh, he chosen all of them. He chose all of them. And one of them was a devil. And that lets you know that everybody in the church is not saved. Some folk in the church are devils. <laughs> I know this ain't a popular Bible class, but this is what the Lord gave me anyway. Some folk in the church are devils. You mean to tell me baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost can be a devil? You most that's right, according to your Bible. So are you going to be a devil? <laughs> it's pretty bad, isn't it? Or are you going to be saved? Can we say amen? We determine that. And you can't be saved being a disobedient saint. See, when we, uh, the, Paul talks about we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. One of the easiest way for the devil to get a saint is to be disobedient. Because disobedience is a demon. Did you know that? According to Ephesians chapter number two, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Well, first of all, he gets you to have a certain kind of an attitude. He comes, talks to your mind. Uh, and let's use the pastor, since the pastor is the most, uh, uh, is the number one target in the church, if you didn't know that. He gets you to have a certain attitude against the pastor. Then when the pastor tells you to do something and you don't do it, that's disobedience. That's the easiest way that the devil can get to you. Because disobedience is a spirit. The spirit that now worketh in the children of who? Disobedience. And that gets a whole lot of people. Well, we'll get to that as we go along. But let's go to Acts chapter 1. Well, let me see. Uh, St. John chapter 12, verse 4 through 6. St. John chapter 12, verse 4 through 6. Now notice Judah's attitude. Now, here he is before the Lord. <laughs> now, if a person can act up in the presence of God, then you know they can act up today. Is that right? St. John chapter 12, verse number 4 through 6. Now, of course, this is six days before the Passover, and then a woman comes. I think her name is Martha. Uh, Martha uh, uh, was serving supper, and Mary has a pound of ointment of spikenard, and she is very costly ointment, and she uh, breaks open that box and anoints the feet of Jesus. She uses that expensive ointment to anoint his feet. And wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now is that a good thing to do for the Lord? Can we say amen? You know people complain about doing things in the church for the Lord. Well, what type of spirit is that? Well, let's read on. Verse number four. Then saith one of his disciples... Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should what? Betray him. Verse 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, why did he say that? Verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put 
they're in. So why did he get an attitude toward Jesus' feet getting washed? Because they could have sold that ointment, put it in the treasury, he's over the treasury, and because he was a thief, he could steal some of that money. So what was he? A hypocrite. You have some people in the church that set out to do things for the Lord in the church, and you have others that criticize that. Why? Because they're hypocrites. We should never have any problem with any auxiliary, any young people auxiliary. Well, let's use the pastor's aid committee that want to do something for the pastor because the Bible says uh, the elders that rule well be counted worthy of what kind of honor? Double honor. Don't be a hypocrite like Judas was. Because Judas made the statement, but he had an ulterior motives. Some folk in the church have ulterior what? Motives. Well, if he could have this attitude and the Lord is standing there in a bodily form, then how about people today when Jesus is not walking around here at the face of the earth? Well, how can they do that against Jesus? Well, they can do that against the pastor. They can do it against the auxiliary leader. They can do it against the deacons they can, or any of the other leaders in the church or do it against their brother and their sister. You see, we're going to fulfill one part or another of the scriptures. None of us are going to escape. Remember, he says in Hebrews chapter 2, how shall they escape if they neglect so great what? Salvation. But we need to determine don't be a Judas. We should support any auxiliary that tries to do anything in honor of God. If you don't, what type of spirit do you have? Well, I'll leave that for you to think about. All right, let's jump over to uh, verse number, uh, let me see here, chapter 17, verse 12. Let's read that. Chapter 17, St. John, verse number 12. All right. And I'm running out of time. We got one more scripture about Judas after this, then we're going to close this out. But don't be like Judas. Don't fulfill the bad scriptures. Fulfill the good ones. Verse 12, let's read. Now, this is his prayer of intercession that he's praying. All right. While I was with them, talking about the disciples, in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture, what? Might be fulfilled. Judas and the Antichrist, who is the devil manifest in flesh, who will be Satan in the human body, are the only two people in the entire Bible that are called sons of perdition, which means final ruin. And of course, the scripture, he was lost because the scripture had to be what? Fulfilled. Why is it that the scripture had to be fulfilled? Because God saw it happen first. And then he told his prophets about it, and they wrote about it. That's why the scripture had to be fulfilled. Well, there are some other scriptures that had to be fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled. Will we fulfill the part that have been kept? Or will we fulfill the part that are lost? Either way it goes, the scriptures must be what? And they will be fulfilled. Because God doesn't make any mistakes. Can we say amen? <laughs> what he has seen is going to happen. Now, what if I miss the rapture? Myself, after all, nearly 40 years of preaching, 40 years of being saved, baptized, I don't know how many people, taught, I don't know how many Bible classes. What if I am lost and miss the rapture? It's because God saw it happen. And I did something or didn't do something to cause me to fulfill that part of the scripture. 
that says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, the day that we're living in is the most apostate time that man has ever lived. And again, apostasy simply means to fall away from that which is truth. And how do we fall away? How does it happen? Well, let's first of all look at our condition as we go to the apostate church. We got about 45 minutes. Hopefully we can wrap that up. Uh, then we'll take some questions. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Very familiar scripture. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14. Revelation 3, 14, down to verse number 22. And I don't know how I'm going to get through all these scriptures. We might not cover all of them. Um, but we just, to let you know. Now, what we're going to show you is the condition of the church. And then we're going to show you how the church got, into the, got in this condition. And to show you how you can keep from getting in this condition. Because we are in the greatest time of apostasy that has ever been since God instituted time. All right, verse number 14, let's read. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, of course, we know in chapters 2 and 3, he gives us seven churches, right? And these churches actually existed. But these churches mean more than that. Each of these churches represent a period within the 2,000 year church age. The gospel age is to be for 2,000 years. And that 2,000 years is broken up into seven periods. And each of those periods are represented by each of these seven churches. And the names of these seven churches represents the spirit of that church age. We are in the last one. We are in the worst church age out of all of the previous six. And Laodicean means the rights of the people or what the people want. So we're in the church age where the focus of the church is not what God wants, but what the people want to satisfy people. That's why some of the things that are going on in our churches that are going on and the spirit of Laodicea is prevalent in our churches. There are churches that have the spirit of Laodicea. How do we know that? By what goes on in their churches, by the focus of their ministry, by the behaviors of their pastors and their ministries. What are they focused on? What is their goal? What do they preach? Well, that's the era we're in. It's the most dangerous era, uh, and he's going to tell us why. So, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now, who's saying these words? What's his name? Jesus. All right, let's read. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of what? Creation of God. Now, we could take each of these, but we don't have time. So, let's just take the last one. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. When God began his creation, the first thing he thought about was Jesus. Before he said, let there be light or done anything, Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, let's put that in perspective. If Jesus... The purpose of him was to die for the sins of the world. Uh, God had that in his mind from the beginning. So in order for God to do that, to have Jesus to be the beginning, then he had to already know what the purpose of Jesus would be. Why he would have to come. You follow what we're saying? Or did I lose you? <laughs> well, the purpose of Jesus was to die for the sins of the world. But there was no world yet because he had not created a world. There was no sin yet because sin had not come into existence. But the first thing on his mind was Jesus. So God, before the beginning, before the foundation of the world, knew everything that was to happen but the first thing he thought of was himself coming as Jesus Christ. He's the beginning of the creation of who? God. He's the first thing that God thought of when he thought about a creation. Because even before he did anything, he knew how the creation would wind up. 
He knew what it would take to save his creation. He knew and understood that his creation would need saving before he even did anything. Before he said, let there be light. Before the angels were created from the waters. Before he made an earth to put the man on. Before the sun, moon, and the stars. He is the beginning of the creation of God. No wonder the scripture says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of what? The world. Because Jesus was the first thing that God thought of. When he began to think concerning a creation. Even before anything ever happened. All right? There were a number of things that God did before the foundation of the world. First of all, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. The lamb's book of life was written before the foundation of the world. He did a number of things in his mind before he ever did or said what he was going to do. Isn't it something for God to know what's going to happen even before he decides that it's going to happen? I hope I haven't lost you with that. He's the beginning of the creation of God. Now, all of these things are descriptions of Jesus. These are descriptions of revelation of him. And there is no description of him as revelatory as these descriptions in any of the previous church ages, which speaks that in this church, that the church today has more revelation of Jesus Christ than any other church, period. That existed with the exception of the apostles but it is the worst church period all right let's read verse 15 he says i know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot i would thou were what cold or hot so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot i will what spew thee out, out of my mouth now lukewarm is a mixture of hot and cold it's not hot, it's not cold, it is a mixture. And the spirit of this age, the church, has mixed herself. As one prophet said, Ephraim has mixed, mixed herself and has a cake unturned. Um, that's what the church has gotten herself involved in. You see, the Bible says, come out from among them and be what? Separate, but we're not separated. We become ecumenical. Lukewarm also speaks of lack of convictions. It speaks of mediocrity, half-hearted, you know, and we see it all the time in our church services, at least I see it, lukewarmness. You know, you think about it like this, when you first got the Holy Ghost, you were excited, weren't you? What has happened? <laughs> what has happened to us? Have we become lukewarm? <laughs> Well, uh, it is a spirit that exists in our time. Lukewarmness. He says, I would you were cold. Well, in other words, I wish you weren't even saved. Why is that? Because I, you can get saved. I wish you were hot. Why is that? Because you would be what I want you to be. But because you are lukewarm. Now, what's the state of lukewarmness? Lukewarm is neither hot nor cold. Lukewarmness is a condition that a person doesn't even know that they're in. But at the same time, they think that they're all right. Can you imagine, um, as I use an example earlier, um, well, we'll get to that as we go along, but lukewarm. God says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, that's not spitting. When you turn on your faucet and the water just flows out, that's spewing. So what's happening in the church? People are falling out of the church. As fast as they come in, they leave right out. You see them come and get the Holy Ghost, get baptized in Jesus' name, you don't see them no more. As fast as they come in, you see, the day is over when most people come into the church and boom, they get real busy right away. Those days are over. It's like Bishop James Johnson said, when they come in and get saved, they're already spoiled even before you can even get to them. Well, he is spewing them out of his mouth. Why is he spewing them out of his mouth? Because they're neither cold nor hot. They're lukewarm. He can't use them. See, God can't help anybody that don't believe that they need any help. And that's the condition of the church. Well, why is he spewing them out of his mouth? Verse 17, let's read. Because thou sayest, notice he says thou sayest, he's not saying this, thou sayest what? I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So why do they have that attitude? Because they're basing their salvation on things. 
possessions. Now, if you studied many preachers, and I have studied a lot of the preachers of today, and studied a lot of the preaching that is today, most of the preaching is about you. Not very much preaching about Jesus. You very rarely hear anything about Jesus. It's all about you, what God has promised you, your blessing, uh, your season, your winning season, <laughs> your time, your blessing, what God's going to do for you, what God has promised you, nothing about Jesus. And those are the sermons that get people excited. You know why? Because it's what they want to hear. See, one of the tactics of Satan is to appeal to your natural tendencies. See, our natural tendencies is what's in our fallen nature. And Satan knows what's in our fallen nature. So Satan knows what, how to deal with us to get us excited about certain things. And uh, it's very unfortunate. Well, we're going to enlarge on that as we go along. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I don't need anything. I, have, I am what God wants me to be. I am content with what I am. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of what? Nothing. Now, Jesus said, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not of the abundance of the things which he possesses. And I'm going to add a little bit to that, of the things which he does not possess. Because our problem today is things. Either we are scrapping and scraping to keep them, or we are scrapping and scraping trying to get them. Now, I share with Day Bible class today, me, my wife, and our six children lived on $600 a month, and God supplied our needs. We paid tithes, we paid our pledge. Now, we did go through some suffering, and we went through some hard suffering, but God always supplied our needs. And I, and I have been known to ask my children, did you have a childhood, a good childhood? And all of the children said, we had a great childhood. And we're in need. There were times where I couldn't even afford a pair of socks. I was looking at my getting dressed earlier today in Bible class, and I pulled open my drawer and I had all them socks. I said, What suit am I going to wear? Oh, and I pulled out the socks that matched the suit. It, hadn't, it wasn't always like that. Because I was teaching Sunday school one time, and one of the ministers saw, and they went to the pastor and said, Pastor, Brother Raider is teaching Sunday school. He don't have on no socks. And so the pastor called, <laughs> called me in. <laughs> you ain't got no socks? You need to have some socks. Now, he didn't buy me none. He just told me what I need to get. <laughs> there were times that we didn't have any washing powder, so we had to wash our clothes in dish soap. But we never missed a service. Never missed a church service. And that's why I found out um, the uh, workings of dish soap. It makes a lot of lather. <laughs> but that's about it. You know, I see people comment about my suits and how I have all these suits. Well, God has blessed me because for seven years I couldn't afford a suit. And I told you I would get my income tax refund, I would give my, money, my wife some money to buy her some clothes, to buy kids some clothes, the kids some clothes, and buy a car, and that was it. I did that every year for four years. That's four cars in four years. <laughs> it always seemed to last until I got my next income tax refund. <laughs> but God took care of us. Took care of us. So... Now, you know, a lot of people uh, comment about my suits, but let me tell you like this. If you can get a $400 suit, uh, a $259 suit for $65 and $55, would you do it? <laughs> I can't remember the last time I paid full price for anything. You know why? Because God takes care of me. Even if all of you all decided not to pay no more tithes, I ain't going nowhere. God is going to take care of me. He always has, 
and he always will. That's why I never have to preach money because God takes care. Well, you got a BMW. I had a BMW before I got, there, got down here. My son just totaled it out. <laughs> I had a BMW before I came down here. But God has taken care of us. Praise the Lord. So uh, it's not about things. Some people think that they have to work, 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 two, three jobs. It's like what Bishop Paddock said. It's not that the cost of living is so high. It's the cost of us wanting to live so high. You don't have to work yourself to death to make it if you got faith in God. Are y'all hearing me tonight? You ain't got to work yourself to death. All you got to do, if you take care of God's business, he'll take care of yours. And so we were on welfare for years. And I went through a lot of persecution from the folk in the church. But I had a responsibility to take care of my family. I was not going to work a job that was going to pay me a fraction of what I could get on welfare to make sure that my kids eat. Now, I just didn't sit around. I went to school. And uh, I was preached on quite a bit. <laughs> the pastor's friends preached on me. <laughs> but you know, I didn't leave the church. I kept on teaching Sunday school. See, I can't get some of y'all to come teach Sunday school. But I was there with one suit jacket and uh, sometimes with no socks. But I was there. I was there opening up service. You can ask anyone in Michigan about me. And uh, not boasting. But uh, I'm, you know, well, uh, Paul said a man is a fool to boast. But what did he tell the Corinthian church? He said, you making me do it. So, uh, but God supplied all of our needs. There was a time we didn't have no car. <laughs> you know, but God has provided. And he hasn't stopped providing. He's going to continue to provide. So what am I saying? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? All these things shall be what? Added. Added unto you. I helped out a family this week with some money, uh, and somebody sent me some money, the same amount that I gave out from Florida. Talking about happy birthday. My birthday was in June. <laughs> See? I got what? <laughs> I don't want to offend them, so we're not going to send it back. I already paid tithes and gave offering on it, so. But that's what God does. All you have to do is put him first. I was talking to a pastor, and he said he learned to put his family first before the church. I said to myself, it's too bad. No wonder you're suffering. You got it backwards. You don't, you put God first. And he will take care of your family. If you try to take care of your family and put God second, you're going to struggle. Can we say amen? I couldn't believe he told me. A good friend of mine. He said, I've learned to put my family before God. <laughs> I said, you learned the wrong lesson, brother. Well, I've not said too much. Things. Things. All right? Um, they're basing their spirituality on things. That's how you get promoted in the PAW. And one bishop tell me that one brother should be promoted. I know both of them personally, good men. He said one person should be promoted. I said, well, yeah, he's, he's a good guy. You know, yeah, he needs to be promoted. He has so many millions of dollars in the bank. I said, oh, that's the reason? <laughs> well, that, that's how it is today. All right, well, anyway, um, Noah's have need of nothing. And let's read. And Noah's not that thou art what? Wretched and miserable and poor and blind. What? Five things wrong with us and don't even realize it. Now let's take the word naked. I had a person tell me they had a dream that they was up preaching in the pulpit. And a whole lot of people out there watching them preach. And then they looked at themselves and they were naked. No clothes on. Can you imagine? <laughs> don't try to imagine that. We don't want you. <laughs> Can you imagine something wrong with you when you don't even know it until it's too late? Well, this is the condition of the church. Wretched. 
wretched of the poorest quality of a saint in the sight of God that one can be. Miserable. Why are they miserable? Well, Paul said if we have hope in this life only, we are of all men what? So it means that the, 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 the church has hope in this life. Their hope is not in God, it's in this life. Well, they already think that they're all right because of things. What if the things run out? Well, poor, poor in their spirituality, blind, they cannot see their condition, and naked. What is that nakedness? Well, they're not clothed with holiness and humility. And that's the condition of the church today. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy me gold, what? Tried in the fire. Now, what's that? Well, let me give you the scripture. That the trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. So what is God telling us? Get some faith. Put your guns down and get some faith. Can we say amen? Why doesn't the church have any faith? Because, how, well, how do we get faith? What, what does faith come from? By hearing and hearing by what? Well, if there's no word of God being preached, then how can you get faith? You can't get it on your own. Can you preach to yourself? The Bible says, how can they hear except they hear a preacher? You can't preach to yourself. You can't give yourself faith. It comes from God. Well, that's why the church is carnal today, because there's not very much word of God. Oh, they're standing in the pulpit, they got the Bible open, they read the scripture. But they're preaching themselves and not preaching Jesus. Well, remember the seven men that were chosen in Acts chapter six, when the widows were being neglected in the daily ministration? Remember that scripture? They chose seven men. Bible uh, theologians have called them deacons. Those were not deacons. Those are not deacons at all. Now there's a numbers of scripture that tells you why they were not deacons, but I'll just give you one. There were no churches. Churches didn't come along to after the Apostle Paul. He got saved three years later. And then uh, there was some time that he took the gospel to the Gentiles. And once he took the gospel to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles had nowhere to congregate at because they couldn't be in the synagogues, that's when churches were established. And then once the churches grew, then in the uh, first Timothy chapter three, he brought in the office of a deacon, which came probably about 15 years later. 15 years later from the sixth chapter of Acts. So how can you be a deacon if there ain't no church for you to deacon at? Can we say amen? <laughs> there were no churches. So those men were chosen not to wait on the offering table, that was the dinner table. Now, if you wanna work in the kitchen, we got a whole lot of tables back there. <laughs> See? See, where do we get that from? Commentaries, that's why. Instead of looking in the Bible, doing our own research, we rely on the comments of other men that are supposed to be considered theologians. I remember one good friend of mine, a uh, very good friend of mine, uh, who's a suffragan bishop, and told uh, one brother, who was another good friend of mine, he said, I was watching Pastor Johnson teach and you know what? He is a theologian. I put him on the same level as Creflo Dollar. I <laughs> Talk about defeated. I was really defeated. <laughs> Creflo Dollar don't even have the whole, not even baptized in Jesus' name. Well, that's, I thought you'd get a big kick out of that. I wasn't too happy at the time about that. But anyway, um, now those seven men were chosen. Three of them became preachers. Two of them went on to become Bible great. But there was one that is spoken of in the book of Revelation. Remember the scripture talks about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that came from the teachings of Nicholas, who was one of the seven men chosen that was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom in the sixth chapter of Acts. He went wrong and backslid and taught a doctrine that even God said he hated in the book of Revelation. Now Nicholas, 
was a preacher and he wanted to have success as in his ministry and he wasn't having the success that the other ministers his contemporaries were having and so he felt well it's because I need to be more holy so he had a very attractive wife that he withdrew himself and said he was going to be celibate with his wife because he thought that this would increase his stature of his ministry. But then as time went on, he was unable to refrain. And so he fell in sin and the devil spoke to him and in his church, he began to teach that we need to show the love of God to the world. So anyone that you come in contact with, you have relations with them because that's how you show the love of God to them. That was the doctrine of Nicolaitans that Jesus said he hated. So he turned salvation into a immoral act, that that's how you show the love of God by doing those things. And we had two people, I believe it was at the PAW convention years ago, that were in the convention and was teaching a similar doctrine. Now I can call their names right now. I called them in day Bible class, but we're not broad, we're broadcast naturally. But I can call their names. And they were in that class teaching that when the husband and wife are with each other, that they are actually worshiping each other because that act is a form of worship. Now, if that's not the devil, I don't know what is. <laughs> but that's what they, and that was at the PW convention. Said, I can call their names. Uh, I'll tell you after service, but I can't tell you right now. I could tell you, but I'm not, I'm trying to be nice. Because <laughs> I ain't got no shame. I call their names, I don't care. But anyway, um, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be what? Rich, that is rich spiritually. Faith, is that right? And white what? Raiment, that white raiment has to do with holiness. You see, the church is naked. The church is without holiness. Well, the emphasis is not holiness. Emphasis is everything else other than holiness. When's the last time you heard a preacher preach holiness besides me? Well, you might have heard Pastor Hayden preach it, but how many preachers on a national scale do you hear preaching holiness, living holy? That's because that's not the emphasis of the church. It's on things. That's why we bring in unsaved preachers to preach in our convention because they think that they're going to bring their crowds. They, they, they bring in the big name preachers because they think that they're going to bring in their crowds of followers and they never do. When the convention was in Nashville, they brought in the most prominent Baptist preacher in Nashville to come and preach at our convention. And do you know that he didn't bring one person with him and he is the pastor of a mega church in the city where the convention was held you know why God did that because his judgment is on the PAW because of its leaders now I say a whole bunch of stuff don't I don't nobody bother me <laughs> maybe they're scared or screwed Maybe that's why some of them call me and tell me things because they know that I can't hold it. I got to speak out against it. Well, that's how Bishop Paddock trained us. He said, how you fight against these spirits, you get up and teach against them and show God's people in the scripture what's right and what's wrong. Can we say amen? Why do we do that? Well, he says in the book of Deuteronomy that all Israel may hear and fear. And that's why we do that. But not very many of them are doing that, are they? Well, I can't help myself. I have to do it. Well, um, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the what? Shame of thy nakedness, what? The shame of the nakedness of the church is being shown. How is it being shown? Because of the life that the church resembles. Now, this is not every individual. This is God's church as a whole. 
Now, Bishop Herman used to teach, who was the diocesan of the state of Michigan, used to teach that there's three components to the church, which simply is this. There is what the world calls the church. Now, when you look on CNN and Fox News and magazines, when they talk about the church, who are they talking about? The Catholic Church, is that right? Did you hear about the Pope getting stuck in the elevator? Who cares about the Pope getting stuck in the elevator? Are you serious? <laughs> Who did he call on himself to get himself out of the elevator? He's supposed to be the Holy Father. But anyway. <laughs> oh, he was worried now. He was worried. He couldn't get to that Pope mobile because he was worried. But let me stop speaking bad about the Pope. He's a very educated man. He speaks seven languages of his own right. He just don't know God. It's not my fault. He don't know. Don't blame me. He don't know God. It ain't my fault. If I get a chance to talk to him, I'll witness to him. But anyway, um, when they talk about the church, they're talking about the Catholic church. That's component number one. Then there's the visible church, which is everybody we know that has been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the visible church. Then there is the invisible church. So you have the Catholic Church, the visible church, everybody that's born again that we know of. Then there is the invisible church. Who is that? Well, the scripture says in Timothy, the foundation of God standing sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Those that he knows that are in the church that will become the bride of Christ and that will be in the rapture. In that church, there's no hypocrites. In that church, there's no liars. That's the church we want to be in. Can we say amen? The invisible church or the church that God knows that are his. All right? And those that God knows that are his are not lukewarm. They're not like this. They live holy. They have faith in God. They're still holding to the truth. All right? Shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with what? Eyes have that thou mayest what? See, because the condition of the church that is blind, we don't see our condition, so we need to get some eyes out. We can see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore in what? So what's the message for the church today? It's your season? It's your winning season? Well, it's only your winning season. You can only win in your season if you repent. If there ain't no repentance, you ain't going to win. You're going to lose. Out with God. Repent. Now you can't repent if you're blind. You can't repent if you can't see yourself. All right. Verse 20 to 3. Behold, I stand at the door and what? That's the door of the church. He's knocking. Let's read. How's he knocking? If any man hear my voice. So God is talking to us, right? He's talking to us through the preacher. He has manifested his word, Titus said, through preaching. And who does the preaching? The preacher, chiefly the pastor. So if any man will hear my voice and do what? Open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and what? He with me, verse 21, to him that overcometh. Overcome what? Wretchedness, miserable, poor, blind, naked, not aware of our condition, thinking that we're all right when we're all wrong. That's what we have got to overcome. We've got to overcome the things that are going, that are prevailing in God's church today. He says to him that overcometh, and of course he makes seven promises to the overcomer in chapters two and three. To him that overcometh, let's read, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. I don't think there's two people in that throne. He's talking about himself in that glorified body in the office of fatherhood. Because he's God. Is that right? He's the father, he's the son, and the Holy Ghost. So as the son, he's in that body, in the throne. As God, the father, he is in the body, on the throne. And just as he overcame as the son of God and is in the throne, if we overcome, we will be where? In the throne. But we've got to over what? Notice that he that overcometh again and again. So that takes a fight, doesn't it? It takes a fight. 
All right? See, your best friends should not be sinners. You should not have a relationship with sinners that you don't have with saints. That's backwards. Can we say amen? See, uh, I don't have a close associations with homosexuals. <laughs> I don't. Lesbians, drug addicts, drug dealers, my cousins. I had some cousins that were pimping in uh, uh, Nashville. When I go to Nashville, I don't go nowhere around them. <laughs> Now, I don't know if they are anymore. I don't think they're doing that anymore, I hope. Uh, but you are identified with the people you hang around with. I was going to say that, but you already said it. You are identified. How do people see you when they look at you? Now, people talk about me in this city. But they talk about you too. Because I've had some folks. Is so and so still going to that church? Boy, oh, let me tell you about them. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you hear folk talk about me, they're talking about you. <laughs> oh, yeah. People love to talk, don't they? Well, they don't say stuff to your face anymore, they work behind the camouflage of Facebook and Twittering. People will say things about you that they could never say in your face. <laughs> well, you are identified by the people you hang around with. And if you are in the church and saved, your number one family should be the church of God. If it is not, what scriptures are you fulfilling then? At that time, what scriptures are you fulfilling? All right, well, we're running out of time. Um, let's read verse 22. He that what? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the what? Spirits and teachers. That indicates two things. Everybody doesn't have an ear to hear. Number two, there are those that have an ear to hear, but they will not hear. But if you're going to fulfill that part of the word of God, that will be saved in the end, you will have an ear to hear and you will have a will to do in order to save yourself. We've got to save ourselves. My wife can't save me and I can't save her. We can't be saved together. If we're gonna be saved, we're gonna be saved as individuals. So if you can't come to church because your husband can't come to church, what scripture are you fulfilling? If you can't come to church because your family has something going on that's more important than the church, because that's what you're saying, what scripture are you fulfilling? Are you either put God first or he's not first? There can't be no 1A and 1B when it comes to God. He has to be number one. Is that right? When God wakes us up, he don't say, give me 10 minutes and I'll wake you up and then you land. <laughs> <laughs> thank God he don't hit the snooze button when it comes to waking me up and I don't want him to hit the wait button when it comes to blessing me either I want my, I want my blessings to be right on time do you want yours on time alright we got six minutes let's go to 1st Timothy chapter 4 why how did the church get in that condition and this will be our last scripture how did the church get into that condition I guess, Lord William, we'll finish this on Friday. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. It's our last scripture for tonight because we don't want to take advantage of you because we know you got to get on home and get the kids home and our drivers has got to get people home so they can get home at a, at a decent time. So we're trying to be more conscious of that. First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1 through 3. This is our last scripture for tonight and then we're going to close. I wanted to get into the religious demon and all of that kind of stuff, but we'll have to do that on Friday, Lord willing, to Lord Terry's. Let's read. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, this is an express message from the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Let's read. 
that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now, are we in the latter times? Now, I like to put it to you like this, like I did in day Bible class. I used to believe that the closer your needle was to E, the more gas that you had. And so you can imagine, I used to run out of gas all the time. One of my first times coming down here, I ran out of gas and had to call Deacon uh, Charles to come get us some gas. Well, that, I was trying to find a gas station and got lost, so that's why that happened. Well, why was I like that? Well, that's come from being poor because we didn't, once we got a vehicle, then we struggled getting gas. And so, um, but, um, you know, the needle gets to E. Now, if you're still driving, you still have gas. Because if you didn't, the car will cut off. But it's on E. Now, it can cut off at any time. Is that right? So you're on E. Now, I know some cars that we have, it tells you how many miles you can go. But you still get nervous when it's on E. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to me when we ran out of gas. I don't know where we were. Uh, I, I think we were in, I can't, where was we? You remember where we were at? Uh, yeah, we were out on the highway. Oh, we were on 264? I meant to go revisit that area and shout to victory. <laughs> Cane Run Road? Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> uh, my wife was mad at me that day, brother. I think that's the day she fell in love with you when you brought that gas. She was mad at me. Anyway, I'm talking too much. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying is this. We are in the end right now. We're in the end. And it as though is that we are driving and the needle is on E, the car is still going, but we don't know when it's going to stop. That's the whole point I'm making. That's where we are. We're not in the last days, we're in the end. According to your Bible, the last days officially started when Jesus walked the earth. That was 2,000 years ago. So we are in the end right now. The needle is on E. And it's just a matter of time where this thing is going to be over. All right? So, and what's going to happen? Some shall do what? Depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and what? Doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits. Spirits that are in people that seduces you from leaving the faith. Now, what faith is that? That's the apostolic faith. One Lord, one faith, one what? You can't leave the faith and still be in it. Now, there are a lot of folk that are sincere out there, and you don't have to be a bad, wicked, low-down person to be seduced. There's a whole lot of good people out there that are honest and sincere, that have been seduced into leaving the faith. See, when you think of somebody being seduced, you're thinking of the worst type of person. Oh, no, no, no. The devil knows to tell, how to tell the right kind of lie to meet you right where you're at. He don't have to wait for you to become low down. He can meet you right wherever you are. And because he appeals to our natural tendencies, he knows the type of seduction that he could perform before us that we are most, more, most likely to fall for if we are not walking close to God. Right? Depart. Some shall depart from the faith. Leaving the faith and going to the nominal church. How can you leave the faith? Leave the apostolic church. Go to the Trinitarian church and still be in the faith. You can't do that. Can we say amen? Either in or you out. Is that right? One preacher I talked to today, he said, yeah, I heard, I heard what you preached on Sunday. Shut in and shut up. I said, well, there's a whole lot of folk right need to shut up. 
<laughs> shut in and shut up. I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I said, shut out, Doc, shut out, shut out. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have. We're going to close. God bless you. We'll pick this up, Lord willing, on Friday. All right, thank you. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Any, 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 any questions uh, as we wrap this up? Any questions? Uh, yeah, Brother Anderson has a question. Bishop Johnson, uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, ask, what, what does half-baked mean? I think it's uh, uh, in uh, Amos or, uh, okay, a Hosea, but uh, the writer was de describing some of the fallen nature of Israel. Well, you're talking about where it says Ephraim is a cake unturned? Well, in order to properly bake a cake in those days, you had to turn it so that it could be done on both sides. So one side was burnt and the other side was not done. So Israel was a mess, is what he was saying. That's why he calls him Ephraim, because Ephraim is a term for the backslider. All right, so God called, him, called them Ephraim because they were backslidden and they were like a cake on turn. Either side, any way you look at them, they were a mess because of their sins. All right, let's get uh, Sister, is that Sister Smith? All right, we get Sister Smith there. I know, Miss, if you say we can't preach to ourselves, but we can encourage ourselves in the faith. Yes, you and can. And I, I do it all the time. I have to encourage myself in the faith. Well, you know, when we say you can't preach to yourself, you can't do for yourself what the preached word from the preacher can do. You know, but David encouraged himself. I encourage myself all the time. So but we we're talking about preaching. We we're talking about encouraging. But that is true. Anyone else? All right. All right. Well, if no one else will take our offering. And uh, thank you for your, for your attendance tonight. And uh, I know on, on Friday will be the uh, wake and um, if